وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى Today we're going to be starting a two-day دورة a two-day دورة two-day intensive course on the book عمدة الأحكام and we're not going to be doing the entire book but we're going to be studying a chapter from the book the chapter of fasting and the hadith that we're going to be taking are 32 hadiths inshallah ta'ala today we're going to take 16 bi'idhnillah al-kareem and tomorrow we're going to take another 16 inshallah ta'ala if we don't take 16 today we will finish the rest tomorrow inshallah ta'ala but before we go into the book i want to mention that a bit about the book what is this book and the second thing that i want to do inshallah ta'ala is i want to speak about uh, the author of the book okay before the salah inshallah ta'ala this book is authored by an imam whose name is whose name is Abdul Ghani Ibn Abdul Wahid Ibn Abdul Wahid Abdul Ghani Ibn Abdul Wahid Ibn Ali Ibn Surur Ibn Rafi' Ibn Hussein Ibn Ja'far Al Jama'ili Al Maqdisi Thumma Al Dimashqi Al Salihi Al Hanbali Al Athari so his name is Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid Al Maqdisi. That's what he's known as Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid Al Maqdisi. And his kunya is Abu Muhammad. His kunya is Abu Muhammad. The Sheikh was born in Jamma'il. Jamma'il. That's where the Sheikh was born. Min Ardi Filastin. Min Ardi Filastin. Which is part of Philistine. And he was born, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Sanata Ihda wa Arba'ina wa Khamsmi'a. He was born 541 Hijriya. Ala Adhar al Aqwali. There are many views, but this one seems the most apparent. Okay, that, this is what seems most apparent that he was born 541 Hijriya. The scholars they attribute him to Bayt al-Maqdis by calling him al-Maqdisi because Jama'il is close to Maqdis. It's very close to Bayt al-Maqdis. It's in Palestine and it's close to Bayt al-Maqdis. So he was named after it. So he's called Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi. Maqdisi here means Bayt al-Maqdis. His father Abdul Wahid, the author, his father Abdul Wahid, Abdul Ghani's father Abdul Wahid, was from the first part, I mean the first group of people from his family to flee uh, Bayt al-Maqdis. There was a, a tyrannical leader who were killing and massacring. There was a non-Muslim, by the way, who was killing the Muslims. And so Abdul Ghani's family, they fled Bayt al-Maqdis, they hid. And when they hid, they traveled to a place called Dimashqa, Damascus today. They went to Damascus. And this was the year, Sanata uh, 551 Hijriya. So he was only 10 years old. Based on the birth, he's only 10 years of age. Abdul Ghani's family is a family 
ilmiyatun salihah, a righteous, noble family. They used to be called Ussalatu Salihiyah, the righteous family. That's what they were known as. Their worship, their ibadah. And they were also known as a family of knowledge. He came out from a house of knowledge, rahimahullah. His family were rooted in knowledge, generations, generations. They were rooted in knowledge and ilm. And they weren't just rooted in knowledge, but they were rooted also in piety and nobility. So from a very early age, he embarked on the path. He embarked on the path of seeking knowledge and gaining knowledge. And he started to seek knowledge in Dimashq. Where did he start to seek knowledge in? Dimashq. And he took knowledge from the leader of the family. The man who used to run the family. And his name was Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudamat al-Maqdisi. Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudamah al-Maqdisi. Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudamah al-Maqdisi is the father of Muwafaquddin ibn Qudamah al-Maqdisi, the author of Kitab al-Mughni, the author of the book, Hanbali book, al-Mughni, which is the Sharah of Muhtasar al-Khiraqi. His father, Muwafaquddin, his name is called Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudamah al-Maqdisi. So the father of Muwafaquddin was the man who ran the family. And so, Abdul Ghani sought knowledge from him. And Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi is the uncle of Abdul Ghani. Okay, he's an uncle to him. He's an uncle to him. But their, their relationship is from his mother's side, not from the father's side. Abdul Ghani and Muwafaquddin. We'll speak about, speak, speak about that soon. So anyways, he took knowledge from Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama. He taught him knowledge and he studied with him a good amount. But as you all know, scholars don't stay in one place when they want to seek knowledge. They travel. Traveling was the way forward. They would go and they would travel to seek knowledge. They would go to places where knowledge was mentioned. They would go to the ulama around the world to meet them, to take knowledge from them. That's what they would do. And Khatib al baghdadi Imam al-Mashriq, he wrote a book called al al-ilm, like traveling to seek knowledge. He has a book on that. And he mentions in there stories of great scholars who traveled to seek knowledge. So Abdul Ghani is from those scholars who went to seek knowledge, to gain knowledge from scholars. He took knowledge from, rahimahullah, other than his uh, uncle, he took it from Abi al-Makarim, Abdul Wahid ibn Muhammad ibn Hilal, who died in the year 565. And he also took from Abi Ma'ali Abdullah ibn Sabir, who died in the year 570-76. Salman ibn Ali al Rahbi, who died in the year 569. When he was 20 years old, he traveled to Baghdad. When he went to Baghdad, and the year was taqriban sanata ihda wa sitina wa khamsumia. It was 561. So he's 20 years old. 561. And he went with his cousin. Who was his cousin I just mentioned right now? Muwafaquddin ibn Qudama, the author of the Kitab al Mughni. The Mughni is a big book. It's the Sharah of the Kitab al Muhtasar al Khiraqi. He went with him. Both of them went together. And this shows us that when you want to seek knowledge, it's also good to take someone with you because you can encourage one another. Anyways, they both traveled to Baghdad. And when they went to Baghdad, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, he was more inclined to fiqh. Ibn Qudama loved fiqh more. Amyalu ila al-fiqh. He leaned towards fiqh. Whereas Abdul Ghani, Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi was more inclined to hadith and the knowledge of the narrators and the senate and etc. That's what they both were like. When they went to Baghdad, the first person they met was Abdul Qadir al-Jailani. Abdul Qadir al-Jailani is from the A'immatu min Ahl sunnah He's a great Imam. Hanbali al-Madhab, great scholar. But some people came and they were extreme on him. But Abdul Ghani has nothing to do with that. 
was being attributed to him has nothing to do with him. Ala kulli hal, when they went to Abdul Ghani, Abdul Wahid, uh, so when they went to Abdul, Abdul Qadir al Jailani, they took from him and they learned from him hadith and fiqh. And Abdul Ghani died in year 561. They took from him. Also, they took from the other scholars that were there and they read things on them like Abil Fatih Nasr ibn Fatiyan. Um, also, uh, Abi Al-Fatih Muhammad ibn Abdul Baqi ibn Batti, Ahmad ibn Al-Muqarrab al-Karhi, Abi Bakr ibn Al-Naqur, Hibatullah ibn Al-Hassan ibn Hilal al-Daqqaq, Abi Zur'at al-Tahir ibn Muhammad al-Shaybani al-Maqdisi. They took from those scholars. And they stayed in there um, four years. They stayed in Baghdad for four years. And then they came back to Dimashq, where they were uh, originally at. After four years of being in Baghdad, they came to Dimashq. And then he traveled to Egypt, Abdul Ghani. And then he traveled to Iskandaria. And that time he met the scholars of that time. From them is Abu Tahir as Silafi, because he's seen. Abu Tahir as Silafi, Silafi, who died in the year 576. He met him and he took from him. He also took from Abu Muhammad Abdullah ibn Barri and Nahwiyu. He was a grammarian of his time. He took knowledge from him as well. And he went back and forth to many different countries. They said that the scholars that he took from were more than a hundred teachers. More than a hundred teachers. Abdul Ghani, Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi. And each person he took from, he took them from, from them a great portion of knowledge. This shows us the dedication and the hard work of these great scholars. We might have a lesson in our local masjid and may not travel to it. But these A'imma, they traveled from one side of the world to the other side and the scholars they mention knowledge doesn't come to you but you have to go to knowledge you have to travel for knowledge if you want to attain it Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi what was his characteristics like what type of person was he the scholars they said he had noble characteristics had a great noble characteristics rahimahullah his akhlaq was very good very high they Attributed to him بِالْحِفْضِ tasnif, His memorization was precise. And he was a person who authored, rahimahullah. He wrote, he wrote many books. They said that he was a person who used to call to the good and prohibit the evil. If he saw someone do something wrong and he went against Allah's religion in the most gentle manner, he will go and approach that person and he will inform them of it. He was strong in that regard. Calling to the good, and prohibiting the evil. Rahimahullah ta'ala. وَكَانَ لَا تَأْخُذُهُ فِي اللَّهِ لَوْمَ تَلَائِمٍ And he never cared the blame of the one who blames him. He never cared. If this is what was pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jalla, and this is what Allah wanted, he would say it. But he would watch the way he said it. And he would say it in a gentle, respectful manner. But he didn't care after that what anyone would say. Rahimahullah ta'ala. His personality was very strong. It was courageous. Rahimahullah ta'ala. He was also mutawadi, a very humble, very humble individual. They described him to be a very generous person, very generous, bil karam. That they said, Rahimahullah, he never used to store anything in his house. And he would never keep anything and store it and keep it to himself. He used to give, Rahimahullah. That it was said about him that he was so generous that if he wanted someone to get something, he wouldn't trust it with anybody else. He would go and try to take that thing to him to the person himself. He used to take the charity and the zakat to the people himself. Rahimahullah ta'ala. He was also mentioned to be a person that when he saw that his student was very good and he was very dedicated and he wouldn't see it uh, problematic and he wouldn't object to it that his student will go and travel and take knowledge from someone else. Because these are bad characteristics with some people. They see a student who's good, who's dedicated, who's got good knowledge, and that he can even pass the teacher. And then they feel that they want to hold the student down. Always keep the student under their wing. Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi, if he saw that the student was very good, and the student was dedicated and ambitious, and he saw that the student was coming with a lot of hard work, he would say to them, Go and travel. Go and travel. Go and take knowledge from other great scholars. And he would, that would please him a lot. 
One of the characteristics that was mentioned about him was he had three sons, Muhammad and Abdullahi and Abdul Rahman. And it was said that he's from the rare scholars who made sure that his, stu- his, his children were his students. And they took knowledge from him and that they benefited from him. Because a lot of the scholars and a lot of the people who seek knowledge and who go to this path of seeking knowledge, a lot of them what happens to them is they forsake their children and they forget about their children. And you rarely come across a scholar whose son became a scholar as well. There are, but they're very little. And if somebody was to take time out and to author a book in this regard, it would be very good. To compile all of the scholars who are children, whose children became scholars after them. Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi, as I mentioned, his teachers were more than a hundred, and I mentioned some of them. And some of his teachers were female teachers. They were female teachers that he took knowledge from. Ilmul Hadith, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And some of his female teachers are mentioned in the book At Targhib of Du'a'i Wal Hathi Alayha. Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi, Rahimahullah. As I said before, he was inclined more to hadith and the science of hadith. That's what his field of expertise was, rahimahullah ta'ala. And that was the field that people would come to him to take knowledge from him. And from his students in hadith was his own cousin. His own cousin. Um, Abdullahi, uh, Ibn Ahmed, uh, Ibn Muhammad, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, Mufaquddin, the author of al-Mughni, took knowledge from Abdul Ghani when it came to hadith. He took knowledge from him and he benefited uh, from him. His children also took knowledge from him and he gave them all ijazat in hadith. From his students is Al-Hafid Abdul Azim Al-Mundiri, the author of the kitab Al-Targhib wa Targhib. That's a famous book. Therefore, he's from the student of Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid Al-Maqdisi Rahimahullah. Brothers, Abdul Ghani, as any other scholar of his time, he went through trials and tribulations. Scholars were always tested, and people of knowledge were tested. And it comes with the territory. It comes with this path of seeking knowledge that you'll be tested. I'm going to mention three times, I mean, three situations of his life, rahimahullah ta'ala. The first of the tests that he went through is, he entered into Asbahan. Ama Asfahan. Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi, he entered into Asfahan. He came to Asfahan. When he came into Al-Asfahan, Abdul Ghani Abdul, Ibn Abdul Wahid Al-Maqdisi, he came across a book called Ma'arifat Al-Sahaba, like knowing the companions. And this kitab is written by Abu Nu'aym Al-Asfahani, Ama Abu Nu'aym Al-Asfahani. This is it's written by him. Abdul Ghani Ibn Abdul Wahid Al-Maqdisi, he read the book. He read the kitab Ma'arifat Al-Sahaba. And when he read the book, he saw in the book 200 mawdi'an, 290 places where the author did mistakes. He came and he stood over 290 places where the author, Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani, did mistakes in the book. So he pointed, he pointed that out. And so when he pointed that out, he was highly criticized because he's in the land of what? The land of Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani. Abu Nu'aym was from this land and he's in Asbahan. And so he was criticized greatly. And the people who fought him highly was a Usra, a family known as Bayt Khujandi, Bayt al khudanjiyu which were an Ash'ari group. And Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi was anti Ash'ara. He was against the Asha'ira creed and he fought against it. And so they used this opportunity to cause him great harm. And because of that, he ran away. He ran away from Asbahan hiding. In the middle of the night, he left. The second time was he covered and he taught the Kitab al Du'afa by Al Uqayli. He taught the book Al Du'afa. By who? Al-Uqayliyu rahimahullah. And in that book, Al-Uqayliyu, one of the people, because the kitab is called Ad-Du'afa, those who are weak. Those who are? Those who are weak. 
And in there, Al Uqayliyu mentioned one of the people who were weak in hadith is who? Al Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. He mentioned that in a book. And so, Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al Makhdisi, when reading the book, he came across this part and he explained it. And so, he was caused great harm in the land that he was at at that time, which was Mosul. Mosul is the second land. They were Hanafis in fiqh. And so they became very hurt by that. And they gave him a lot of harm. They even intended to kill him. And Al-Burhan ibn al-Barni, Al-Burhan ibn al-Barni, who was a wa'id, a reminder, who had an influence on the community, who was a reminder, used to heart soften the people. He felt that he had to help the sheikh. So he helped him get away from the place. The third time he was tested was when he came to Dimashq. Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi. He came to Dimashq and the people accepted him. When they saw his knowledge, when they saw his piety, and when they saw his understanding of the religion. So a group of people, they became jealous and envious of him. They were jealous. Hasad entered their hearts towards Abdul Ghani. And so what they did was they tested him in his aqidah. They said, What do you believe? And so he mentioned what he believed. And he mentioned his aqidah. And so they said to him, you're not allowed to teach. No, you can't teach. And if you do, we're going to cause you harm. And so they forced him to leave Dimashq. To leave Dimashq. You're not going to be here anymore. فَضَاقَ ذَرْعَ The land became very tight on Abdul Ghani, Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi. So he went to Ba'labak. He went to Ba'labak. When he went there, he left there as well. And he went to Misr, Egypt. When he came to Egypt, he sat down to teach in Egypt hadiths of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the people benefited from him. The fuqaha of Egypt, because he was going against their fiqh, he was going against their fiqh and their verdicts of fiqh. Um, they told the leader, Al Wazir Al Adil Al Safiyu of Egypt, they said, "This man, get rid of him. He's a problem, and get rid of him." And that they said, "Anahu afsad aqaid al nas." This man corrupted the people's aqidah. He's corrupting the people's aqidah. So the leader said, "Okay." He wrote a letter. I mean, he commanded his scriber to write a letter. He said, "Write, take a pen and paper." And he said, "Write the following." And so when he wanted to dictate, the scriber said, "I don't think it's necessary for you to write anything now." Because Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi has left you guys. Meaning he died. There's no need for you guys to want to get rid of him. He has got, he has left you guys. And he died, Rahimahullah, in Egypt. Rahmatan wasi'a. The scholars of his time, they praised him, praised him, praised him greatly. He was praised highly. And Imam al Dhabi said about him, who was Imam al Alim, al Hafid al Kabir, al Sadiq, al Qudwa, al Abid, al Athari, al Mutaba. Alim al Hufam. He said he is an Imam, an Imam, a person who is followed in good, a Sadiq, truthful man. Al Qudwa, he was a role model. He was a Abid, a worshipper. Al Athari, a person who followed the Kitab and the Sunnah, wa bima alihi salafu salih, and that which the pious predecessors were upon. Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir said about him, Kana nadinan fi zamani. He was rare in his time. No one liked him. في أسماء الرجال in the narrators and the names of the narrators حفظا وإتقانا وسماعا وإسماعا وسردا للمتون وأسماء الرجال he was unique in the way he memorized and he was precise in the narrations and the hadith he knew the different wordings he knew the what different wordings of hadith who narrated this wording and who narrated that wording he was precise in it he was solid and he was strong in the narrators رحمه الله تعالى رحمة واسعة one of the best people to talk about him is his own cousin, Ibn Qudama rahimahullah, the author of the Kitab al-Mughni, Mufaquddin Ibn Qudama. He said about him, he said about him, كَانَ جَامِعًا لِلْعِلْمِ amal. He combined between knowledge and implementation of knowledge. Like he implemented what he knew, rahimahullah. وَكَانَ رَفِيقِي فِي الصِّبَى And he was my friend when we were young. We sought knowledge together. وَفِي طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ When we were seeking knowledge. وَمَا كُنَّا مِيَنْ هِمْ وَنَّبَى نَسْتَبِقُ إِلَىٰ خَيْرٍ We never competed in good إِلَّا سَبَقَنِي إِلَيْهِ 
he would always beat me in it illa al-qalil except something small here and there wa kammal allah and allah completed on him what fadilatu allah's virtue he completed on him he did it bi ibtilahi bi adha ahli al-bid'ah and that was through the people of innovation of his time they caused him a great harm wa adawatu iyah and they had hate in their heart towards him wa qiyamuhum alayhi and they stood against him wa ruzqa al-'ilm knowledge was given to him rahimahullahu ta'ala it was also said about him law aqama al-hafiz bi asbahan if he was to stay in asbahan and he was to remain there and he was to be patient rahimahullahu ta'ala muddatan a period of time wa arada an yamlikaha and he wanted to take over asbahan la malakaha he would have been able to take over asbahan meaning the people loved him they really really loved him rahimahullahu ta'ala they loved him at-taj al-kindi rahimahullah he said lam yakun ba'da ad-dar qutni after dar qutni there was no one like abdul ghani ibn abdul wahid al-maqdisi after dar qutni and who is dar qutni dar qutni is the one who authored the 20 volume book al-ilal al-waridah from memory it's a 20 volume book he he, he dictated it from memory dar qutni rahimahullah ta'ala no one came after him like abdul ghani ibn abdul wahid al-maqdisi Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al maqdisi has many books. Some of the scholars, they mention his books reach 70. But the most, the most famous ones I'm going to mention, inshallah ta'ala. The most famous one is the Kitab al-Kamal fi Asma'i al-Rijal. Al-Kamal fi Asma'i al-Rijal. The Kitab al-Kamal was written by him and it's the narrators of the six books of hadith, the imams of the six books of hadith. Who are the imams of the six books of hadith? Al-Bukhari, Al-Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Al-Nasai, Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Al-Nasai, and Ibn Majah. Those four books and the two Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim. Those six. What he did was, he wrote all of those Imams, their narrators. Their narrators. He wrote a book in it. So if you want to find those six Imams, their narrators, you find it in that book. Their biography, who they are, where they were born, who they took from. He authored a book in it. Rahimahullah. And that's the book that scholars came after that and they summarized it. Abu al-Hajjaj al-Mizzi came, he summarized it into a kitab called Tahdeeb al-Kamal fi Asma'i al-Rijal. And then after him came Dhabi and then Mughlatai and then uh, what do you call it? Ibn al-Hajjaj came until Ibn Hajar uh, came. And Ibn Hajar summarized it into his at He, This is book is one of his books. Umdatul Hakam is one of his books. But what many people don't know there's two Umdatul Ahkams. And many people don't know that. There's two Umdatul Ahkam. And they're both published. And they're both present. The difference is that the first Umdatul Ahkam is Kubra. It's big. It's got 900 and I think 40 hadiths in there. 940 hadiths in there. It's big. It's what? It's very big. This kitab, this one right now, is less than it. It's what? It's less than that. It's 40, 400 and something hadith in there, right? 400 and something hadith. It's called Umdatul Sura. It's the little one. The first one is Kubra, the big one, and this one is called the Sura. The overwhelming majority of the scholars, they explain the Sura, the small one. They don't explain the big one. They don't explain the big one, generally speaking. The author, Rahimahullah, he died of illness, Marada Shadidan, Mana'ahu Al Kalam, Wal Qiyam. That stopped him from talking the illness that he had he was unable to talk and he was also unable to stand and his illness became more and it carried on for 16 days for 16 days he was very sick rahimahullah and he died rabi' al-awwal the year 600 hijriya rahimahullah he died in egypt and he died on a monday al wal on the 23rd of rabi' al-awwal year 600 and he was old his age was 59 yeah that's very young just under 60 years of age that's a very young age and he left this behind the last thing that i want to talk about before i start is what is this book about remember it's a hadith book this book is a hadith book okay and the scholars, the way that they used to write hadith books are different. 
Some scholars would write hadith on 40 had narrations of the most comprehensive speeches of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an Imam al-Nawi did. 40 hadiths and these 40 hadiths are the comprehensive speeches of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other scholars they would write hadiths based on heart softening, virtuous actions like Riyadh al-Salihin. Riyadh al-Salihin is what? It's based on what? Fadailul A'mal, righteous actions. Hope, fear, heart softening. That's Riyadh al-Salihin. But it's hadith. This kitab is not for heart softening. Okay? And it's not virtuous actions necessarily. This book is written on al-ahkam, jurisprudent rulings. And these ahadiths are called ahadith al-ahkam. They are what? Ahadith al-ahkam, jurisprudent rulings. Jurisprudent rulings. You're learning hukum shar'i. Is this permissible or is it not? Am I allowed to do this or not? Basically, it's hadiths where you take, take from it fiqh. You take from it fiqh. This book, Umdatul Ahkam, scholars would memorize it. Scholars would what? They would memorize it. And they would take time out to memorize it. Many great scholars have memorized it. From them is Sakhawi rahimahullah memorized it. Iraqi memorized it. Ibn Hajar al Asqalani memorized it. Shawkani memorized it. Great scholars that you're looking at today, you're reading their works, they memorize Umdatul Ahkam. Because you need it in your day to day life. When somebody asks you, is this permissible? You, know, you need to know the hadith in your head. And as I always say, knowledge is that it's two things that come together. It's hifdun ma'a fahmin. It's memorization with understanding. So these 32 hadiths, if you could take time out to memorize it from the chapter of fasting, after having understood it, it will help you a lot. It will help you a lot, inshallah ta'ala. The scholars, they took time out to explain this book of its importance and how good it is. And I'm going to mention some of the explanations that have been put on this book. I'm going to mention the most important ones because there's so many that have been put on it. One of the most, and I personally believe it's the best explanation, one of the best explanations of Ibn Al-Hakam is the explanation of Ibn Al-Daqiq Al-Eid. The, the explanation of Ibn Al-Daqiq Al-Eid. Ibn Al-Daqiq Al-Eid, he has a sharah called al ihkam al ahkam fi sharh umdat al ahkam all together the best publication that recently came out is the darul lubab from sham ahmed dimashq darul lubab that's the best publication and the beautiful thing about that one is it is that it's got the sharah of Ibn al-Daqiq al-Eid on there, which is al-Ihkam al-Ahkam. And it also has, it also has the Udda of Amir al-San'ani on there. The footnotes of, and the Hashi of Amir al-San'ani. Published together. One of the scholars that explain this book in more than 20 volumes is Ibn Mulaqin, rahimahullah. The teacher of Ibn Hajar. He called it Al-I'lam bi fawaid umdat al-ahkam. He called it Al-I'lam bi fawaid umdat al-ahkam. Ibn Mulaqin rahimahullah ta'ala, the teacher of Ibn Hajar. The third scholar that who explained it is um, Al-Fakihani rahimahullah. He has a sharh called Riyadh al-Afham fi sharh umdat al-ahkam. Which is very good. Also the sharh of Safarini. He has a kitab called Kashf al-Litham. Kashfu al All of these books we're going to be quoting them, inshallah ta'ala. Also, one of the explanations that have been put on it is the sharah of Sheikh Abdul Nasr al-Sa'di. He explained it as well, rahimahullah ta'ala. Also, Al-Ilman by Ismail al-Ansari, rahimahullah. He explained it. Tanbihu al-Afham fi sharah umdat al-Ahkam by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin. But the one that has come out by the Mu'assasat al-Risal, Mu'assasat al-Sheikh ibn Uthaymin, which is one thick volume, I think it stops at Kitab al-Hajj. If I'm not wrong, I'm in the chapter of Hajj. Also, there's a sharah by Abdullah al-Bassam. Abdullah al-Bassam, his sharah is the most famous one that everybody knows of, which is called 
which is called Taysir al-Allam fi Sharh Umdat al-Ahkam. And there are many more. More than a hundred explanations have been put on it. Are we all together? One of the new explanations, one of the new explanations that really recently came out is the Sharh of Abdullah ibn Salih al-Fawzan. Abdullah ibn Salih al-Fawzan's one came out recently. He called it Mawrid al-Afham fi Sharh Umdat al-Ahkam. Fi Sharh Umdat al-Ahkam. And he is a unique author, rahimahullah, a unique author in the way he wrote, rahimahullah ta'ala. His was very good and it's beneficial. He previously explained Bulug al-Maram, he called it Minhat al-Allam, fi sharh Bulug al-Maram, which the scholars loved. Ten volume, Darul Minhaj, published it, everybody ran after that book and everybody loved it. Recently he brought out the explanation of Umdat al-Hakam, rahimahullah, he's still alive. He came out with this one recently. A couple of months, it just came out ago. Rahimahullah. Anyways, I'm going to be quoting for, from all of those books here and there. You hear those names and those authors sometime. But the way that I plan to go through this explanation is at tasheel to make it easy. I don't want to go into too much details. I'm not going to mention too much difference of opinions. I'm only going to mention al qawlu rajih indi, the strongest opinion to me. I'm going to tell you the strongest opinion that I believe to be a strongest in that issue. If you want to then go research more, you're entitled to do so, and you might even differ with me. You might even differ with me. We're going to take, as I said, those first 16 hadiths today, inshallah ta'ala. And tomorrow we're going to take the second 16, inshallah ta'ala. The way that it will be studied is, Akhuna Abdul Samid is going to read the hadiths on me, and I'm going to explain the hadith. Each hadith, we're going to extract benefits from it. Bi-idhnillahi al-kareem. Walillahi alhamdu al-minna. We've spoken about the author of this book, Umdatul Ahkam. The name of the author, who is he, a bit about his life. In a very summarized manner, of course. We also, walillahi alhamdu al-minna, walillahi alhamdu al-minna, praises to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And glory is to him. We also spoke about a bit about the book, what this book deals with, how many ahadiths are in there, how important it is for one to memorize it. We've also spoken about um, the explanations that have been put on this book. Now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to start the chapter of fasting, Kitab al Siyam, the chapter of fasting. What does Asiyamu mean in the Arabic language? What does Asiyamu mean in the Arabic language? It means Al Imsak. Al Imsak is to withhold. The word, the Arabic word Asiyamu, Amasawmu, it comes from the meaning of Al Imsak, to withhold, to refrain from something. Okay? And as Abu Ubaidah mentioned in his Majaz al-Qur'an and also is mentioned in Ibn Faris mentions in Mu'jam Maqais al in the Arabic dictionary that the word as fasting is to withhold from everything mutlaq al-imsak it means that you withhold from food you also withhold from speech all of that is fasting all of that is, all of that is fasting. And that's why the mother of Isa ibn Maryam, she said, قالت إني نذرت للرحمن صوما فلن أكلم اليوم إنسيا. So what did she say? Sorry, فقولي إني نذرت للرحمن صوما. فَقُولِي إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ I made a covenant and an oath with Allah إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ صَوْمًا A fasting And then after that, what did she say? She said, I made a promise with Allah that I'm going to fast And then what did she mention after that? فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ In Siyan, I'm not going to talk to anyone So, holding from speech is also fasting She's using the the Arabic usage, the linguistic, the lexical usage. 
where it means to restrain, I mean, refrain from something, whether it be speech, whether it be food, all of that is what? It is uh, the meaning of as lughatan in the Arabic language. Shara'an in the Sharia, it means al imsaku bi niyatin muftirat, al mufattirat. It is to withhold from the things that can break your fasting with an intention. Again, it is to withhold, it is to refrain from the things that can break your fast with an intention. So when you're withholding, you're doing it with an intention. And the things that break your fasting are what? Al-ta'amu wa sharabu wal jima'ah. Drinking, eating, and in sexual intercourse. You can't do those three while you're fasting. So the person withholds from those with the intention. So you do it with an intention. It's not like you're, not do, you're doing it because you can't be bothered. Or I don't have food. No, you're doing it with an intention. Your intention is that you're doing to hold back from this. For the sake of Allah. Min shakhsin makhsusin. And it happens from a particular person. There's a particular person who does it. Not everybody does it. We'll see who are the people who can't do fasting. Also, fi waqtin makhsusin. It's done at an appointed time. There's a time which it starts and there's a time which it finishes. That's the definition of fasting in the Sharia. It is al imsaku bi niyati. It is to withhold, withhold, to refrain from, with an intention. Anil mufattirati, the things that can break your fasting. Min shakhsin makhsus, from a particular person. Fi waqtin makhsus, at a particular time. If you want to study fasting, four things is what you need to know about fasting. If you want to learn the fiqh of fasting, if you want to have the understanding of fasting, there are four things that you need to know. The four things are as the one who's fasting, the rulings regarding the one who's fasting. As-sa'imu is the one who's fasting, the one who's doing the fasting. He has to have six conditions, the one who's fasting. If he wants to do fasting, six conditions need to be met. He has to be a Muslim. He has to be aqil, he has to be sane. A person who's insane doesn't fast. So he's a Muslim. Aqil. Baligh. Reach age of puberty. Another one for the women. Ghayru ha'idhin wala nufasa. She's not on her menstruation or she's not on her post, post natal bleeding. Five. Sahihun muqim. The person is, is a resident. So he's muqim, sorry, resident, and also mustati, he has the ability to do it. Are we all together? Those six. Those six are for the person who's fasting. And then the second thing that you need to look at from the four things is what? as with the fasting. Which fasting are we talking about particularly? First of all, the fasting are how many types? The fasting are how many types? There are four types of fasting. There are four types. A fasting which is obligatory. A fasting which is obligatory. And the ones that are obligatory are three. There's only three fastings that are obligatory. Ramadan, you have to fast Ramadan, right? The second one is nether. You made a promise with Allah. You made a promise with Allah. It becomes obligatory on you. You say, oh Allah, I promise I'm going to fast for you. You make a covenant and an oath with Allah. And the third one is kafara, an expiation. You did a mistake in something. You did a, a wrong in somewhere. And you're, you're having to come with an expiation, a kafara you need to pay. And we're going to see one of the kafaras that you need to do. 
We're going to see them. The second type of fasting is that which is muharram, haram, you can't do. And we're going to see it. The ones that are muharram, which is fasting on Eidain. You can't fast on Eid al Adha and Eid al Fitri. It's muharram, it's haram, you can't. You're not allowed to. Sahih? The author is going to bring that. The third one is Sunnah. It's recommended. And then we're going to see that exa- example, inshaAllah ta'ala, which is Siyam with Thalatati Ayyami min kulli shahrin. Fasting three days of every month. Or, fast, or fasting Mondays and Thursdays. Sunnah. And also, Makruh. Disliked. It is what? It's disliked. Which we're going to see um, fasting, for example, on Saturday by itself, for example. Disputed whether it's haram or it's makruh, but fasting Saturday by itself, without no day before it or after it. Are we all together? That's the second pillar that you need to know when you're studying fiqh, fiqh of fasting. The first one was what? as saimu the one who's fasting. You learned the six, right? And the second one was what? The fasting. What type of fasting? Which one are we going to be talking about? The wajib. And the, which one in wajib? Ramadan. Ramadan. The third thing that you need to know is um, the things that corrupt your fasting. The mafasid, ama the mufsid, the things that can corrupt your, that can corrupt your fasting. Some scholars they call it the mufattirat, the things that can corrupt your fasting. And they are what? There are three things that we're going to mention. Taking any substance through your mouth which reaches your stomach deliberately with your choice. You're deliberately doing it. That's number one. That's what it breaks your fast. If you take anything into your mouth and it goes to your stomach, what is it? And you do it deliberately. No one's forcing you. You're not under any duress. It breaks your fast. Number two is sexual intercourse, jima, sexual intercourse, and we're going to talk about the three things that you need to do if you have sexual intercourse in the month of Ramadan deliberately. If you do it deliberately, three things that you need to do in the order that you need to do it. The expiations we're going to mention them, inshallah ta'ala, in the explanation here. The third thing that breaks your fast is at amdan. If the person Vomits deliberately. If he deliberately, deliberately vomits. Those three are going to break your fast. As for hijama, the opinion that I am leaning towards is that it doesn't break your fasting. That the hijama doesn't break your fasting. And inshallah ta'ala, when the time comes, we're going to reconcile between the hadith of Shaddad ibn Awsim, which is in Sunani. Uh, Kutub uh, Ahlul Sunnah narrated it where the messenger said Aftar al-Hajim wal Mahjum, the one who does hijama and the one who does it for him both of them their fasting breaks and the other hadith hadith Ibn Abbas fi Sahih, Sahih Muslim where it says ihtajam al-Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa sa'im al-Muhrim the messenger did hijama whilst he was fasting how do we reconcile between that we will come to it but me as i mentioned those are the three that break your fasting if you want to know you should study that third part part so what's the first thing that i said that you need to know about fasting the one who's fasting what's the four things i said four things you need to know about the fiqh of fasting if you don't know these four you're not going to learn fiqh of fasting the first one is Asa'imu, the one who's fasting, and the six conditions that I mentioned. The second one is 
the fasting itself and its types. Four types, we mentioned them. Wajib, Muharram, Masnoon, Amma Mandub, Amma Sunnah, and Makru. We mentioned each one, right? And we spoke about the Al-Mufsid, Al-Mufattirat, the things that break your fasting. And we mentioned three, and one we said there's a difference of opinion regarding it, whether it breaks it. Are we all together? <coughs> Remember the three that we spoke about are actions that you do that break your fasting. Are we all together? Are we all together brothers? Three things I mentioned there are actions that you do that will break your fasting. The first one is taking any substance into your mouth, okay, that reaches your stomach or break your fasting. Number two, what was it? Sexual intercourse. Fi nahari Ramadan. We're talking about while you're fasting. At night time, no. We're not talking about night time. We're talking about na- daytime. And three, one is what? If you vomit. If you, do- if you make yourself vomit. Not if you, you feel sick and you vomit. That doesn't break your fasting. I said, attaqayyu amdan. The person puts his finger in his mouth and he brings it out. Deliberately. It'll break your fast. What also breaks your fast that which isn't action that breaks your fast is niyatul fitri if the person intends in his head to break his fast even if he doesn't even if he doesn't eat it breaks his fasting because remember what we mentioned at the beginning what was the definition that we gave for fasting that the person comes with the intention to restri- refrain from this so if you get rid of that intention it will break your fasting also, what breaks your fasting is takrarul nadar. If a person looks at a woman, a man looks at a woman too, so many times that it leads to ikhrajul mani, that the, something comes out from his genital private part, then this also breaks your fasting. Are we all together? That's deliberately looking at the opposite gender will break your fasting, which then leads to, of course, it leads to the ikhrajul mani, that the mani comes out. It breaks the fasting. Also, the last and the fourth thing that they were going to take here, inshallah ta'ala, in the book is al um, fihi, the things that you do in fasting. The things that we should do inside fasting. And the author, rahimahullah, he mentions um, suhoor. Suhoor are things that you need to do in fasting. We're also going to take hastening the iftar, which we're going to take. We're also going to take al-i'tikaf. We're also going to take qiyamul layl, taraweeh, qiraatul Quran, reciting Quran. All of those are things that you need to do within Ramadan. Does that make sense? Those are the four things that this whole two-day seminar is going to be about. That's a khulasa, a summary, right? Now we're going to start, inshallah, we're going to start the hadith, inshallah ta'ala. You all have an overview now? You have an idea? Naam. Before I start, fasting, when, what year was it made obligatory? Put your hand up if you know, so we can make the class interactive. Put your hand up if you know, don't shout the answer out, just put your finger up. If you know when fasting was made obligatory. It was made obligatory on the second year of the Islamic calendar after Hijrah to Rasulullah. When the Prophet migrated to Medina, two years later it was made obligatory. So it was a sanat al thaniyati min al hijrah. And this is bil ijma. There's no difference of opinion. There's no difference of opinion. It's a consensus. And again, fasting was made obligatory tadriji and gradual. It wasn't made obligatory all at once. It was made obligatory tajrijiyan. First of all, the person was given a choice. The person was given a choice. If he wanted to fast or if he wanted to eat. Allah said, فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ Whoever wants to do voluntary and he wants to come with tatawa' فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرُ اللَّهِ Anyone wants to do voluntary, then that's good for him. And then what did the ayah say? وَأَنْ تَصُومُ for you to fast is good for you. It wasn't obligatory now. If you wanted to fast, you can fast if you want. You, there was a choice. 
But then that got abrogated um, from Ramadan. But it was voluntary for other fastings that we speak about, inshallah ta'ala. But Ramadan, it became فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ مُشَارَةً فَلْيَصُمْ Anyone who saw the fasting, of the entering of Ramadan, what, did she, what should he do? فَلْيَصُمْ Fast. It became what? It became obligatory, you have to fast. There are benefits that are in fasting. I'm going to mention them, inshallah ta'ala. There are four benefits that I'm going to mention that are in fasting. Four benefits. The first benefit is fasting is one of the biggest means to attain taqwa. Fasting is one of the biggest means, one of the greatest means to attain taqwa, piety of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Because what did the ayah say? The ayah of making fasting obligatory. What did Allah say? What did Allah say? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon tattaqoon Idhan to attain taqwa fasting was one of the means for it. Number two. Fasting allows you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abstaining and staying away from your desires. To stay away from what? From your desires. Everyone loves to follow their desires. Everyone wants to eat and enjoy himself and drink. But when you've shown that you're not going to eat and you're not going to drink and you're not going to have intimate relationship with your spouse, what came out of there? Sidqul mahabbati lillahi ta'ala That you are truthful in your love to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Ha. You're a person who really loves Allah. Because what did you do? You pushed away your desires and what your nafs wants and you gave precedence to Allah Azza wa Jalla and that which He commanded. Number three, fasting brings about self-discipline. Self-discipline. That's what fasting brings about. You are learning patience. You are learning forbearance. You don't need to go to a self-development course. Fasting gives you that, that self-discipline. That you are a person who has control over himself. That I tell myself when I'm going to eat. And I can tell myself when I don't want to eat. My body doesn't tell me when to eat and when not to eat and how to eat. Allah said about the non-Muslims, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يَتَمَتَّعُونَ وَيَأْكُلُونَ كَمَا تَأْكُلُوا الْأَنْعَامُ وَالنَّارُ مَثْتُوَ لَهُمْ That the disbelievers, Allah said that they eat. Just eat, just eat. Because their, their desires has more control over than their what? Than them controlling it. They don't have that. They're self-discipline. Are we all together? Whatever doesn't eat you, eat it. That's their policy. Whatever doesn't eat you, you eat it. Like in fasting, what does it give you? Self-discipline. Number four. In fasting, there is health benefits. Okay? There are health benefits in there. But I want you to understand a point here right now. Whereas, whereas there are people who have made all of the ibadat that we do, they've based health benefits. And they say we pray salah because it's a form of workout. And we fast because it's a what? It's a health benefit. No. We do this because Allah commanded us. We do this is because it's a spiritual thing for us. We won't eliminate that it could have health benefits in it. No problem. It could have it. But that's not why we're fasting. Why are we fasting? To attain taqwa from our fasting. So when I say here that... Fasting has health benefits. That's not why you're fasting because you want to lose weight and you want to be slim. And that's not your intent. Are we all together, brothers? You're not doing it because of that. But we don't dismiss the fact that it could have health benefits in it and that there are health benefits uh, in it. And from the things that they mention is that it takes, they said, psychologists and others have stated that it takes for a person to get rid of 
a bad habit, it takes them 29 to 30 days. Are we all together? To get rid of a bad habit. And this is the month where you have that chance to do it. Shaytan is chained, and you have that opportunity. Now. This is the first hadith in the chapter of fasting. This hadith, Bukhari and Muslim both narrated. And there is something I never mentioned about this book. The unique thing about this book is, even that though it's a hadith al-ahkam, that it talks about hadiths regarding and pertaining to jurisprudent rulings, all of the hadith that he mentions in this book are Bukhari and Muslim. And some places where the author does mistakes, the hadiths are either one of the two. It's either one of the two. In other words, every single hadith in Umdatul Ahkam are all authentic. There is not one narration that's weak. So all of these hadiths that we're taking are in Bukhari and Muslim. What are they? Fi Sahihain Bukhari and Muslim. But sometimes the wording that he picks can either be the wording of Bukhari or it can be the wording of Muslim. Like this hadith for instance, the wording that he chose is the wording of Muslim. The wording is the wording of Muslim. But the hadith is in Bukhari, but not in that same wording. Okay? It is not. The hadith says, لا تقدموا رمضان لا تقدموا It means don't go before. It used to be لا تتقدموا in the Arabic language, it used to be La Tatakadamu. Fahudifat ihda ta'ini. One of the two tasks got taken out min babi takhifi to make it easy for the people to say it. It used to be La Tatakadamu. But one tag got dropped, so it becomes easy for the people to say it. So instead of saying La Tatakadam, La Tatakadamu, you just say La Takadamu. With one ta. And it's like the ayah, Wala, Wala tayammamul khabitha, Wala tayammamul khabitha. It's meant to be Wala, Wala tayammamul khabitha. One of the ta's got dropped. And it's from Mibabi takhfif. Why is it called Ramadan? What, what does it say? La tataqaddamu Ramadan. Don't go before Ramadan. What does the word Ramadan mean? The word Ramadan. It comes from the word Ar-Ramba And Ar-Ramba is the pebbles When the heat hits it so much Ramadan comes from the heat And the thirst that the person goes through in the fasting Are we all together brothers? The pebbles when it's out in the day And the sun hits it, it becomes hot Ramadan was named after that Because of the thirst and the hunger that the person goes through That burning heat inside the person the hadith it says لا تتقدموا أما لا تقدموا رمضان Don't go before رمضان بصوم يوم ولا يومين Don't go Don't fast One or two days before رمضان For example today Today رمضان can either be In two more days You're not allowed to fast today You're not allowed to fast Or tomorrow You're not allowed to fast You're not allowed to fast it's prohibited. Here it says, لا تقدم رمضان بصوم يوم ولا يومين. Okay, ولا يومين. There's another wording which says, أو يومين or two days. It says أو. And some people thought it's one of the two that you can't do. There's another wording by Bukhari which says أو يومين or two days. And so they thought it meant one of the two you can't do. They use the O as lit tanweer. Okay? That's incorrect. It means that you can't do two or one day before Ramadan. You're not allowed to do it. 
Ramadan is about to enter, it's close. Two days before Ramadan, you're not allowed to fast. Or one day before Ramadan, you're not allowed to fast. Illa rajulun, except a man. Kana yasumu sawman falyasumhu. Except a man who used to fast. He had a particular fasting that he used to do. He used to fast Mondays and Thursdays. Or he used to fast the three days of every month. And apparently, some of you might think to yourself, the three days, isn't it ayyamul bayd? There's a difference of opinion regarding that. We'll come to this soon, inshallah. So he fast anyways, or he used to fast the fasting of Nabi Lahi Dawood. Dawood what? Kana yasumu yawman wa yuftiru yawma. Dawood would fast one day, he would take a rest the day after, and then he would fast again. So what happened was, it came on those two or one day before Ramadan. It hit it. You can fast, no problem. You're allowed to. You're an exception. You are a what? You're an exception. Because the Prophet said, Illa rajulun except a man kana yasumu yawman fal yasumhu. The benefits that we take from the hadith. We take five benefits from the hadith. Five benefits that we take from the hadith. Number one, that we're prohibited and that we're not allowed to fast a day or two before Ramadan. We're not allowed to. For one of these two reasons. Anything other than these two reasons, you are allowed to fast. Number one, if you do it for any of these two, you're not allowed to fast. You are not permitted to fast. If your intention of fasting one or two days before Ramadan is one of these intentions, then it's, you're, you're prohibited from it. You're not allowed to do it. Is al ihtiyat You're doing it because you want to be on the safe side. You're scared that the people might get it wrong. You're like, I want to be on the safe side. If I start fasting two days before Ramadan, I'm not going to miss Ramadan. No, don't do that. You're not allowed to. Or if you're doing it, or if you're doing it, بِقَصْدِ تَطَوُّعِ You just want to do a voluntary act on the two days before Ramadan. You are not a person who used to do this voluntary. You randomly want to do it two days before Ramadan or one day before Ramadan. Randomly. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed? You're not allowed to do that. You're prohibited from it. It is haram. If you do it, you're sinning. You are sinning. But if you fast, which is the second benefit that we take from the hadith, which is the second benefit is that anyone who had a had a routine you had a routine i used to fast mondays and thursdays in the whole entire year and apparently it happened before two days of ramadan or one day before ramadan or you used to fast the fasting of a dawood then you are permitted to fast one or two days before ramadan no problem you are permitted also, a person is fasting, a fasting of nether. One, one or two days before Ramadan, he is also allowed. Or a person is fasting kafara, an expiation. Then they are allowed to fast one or two days before Ramadan. Or a person is fasting to pay back Ramadan for last year. Last year. Ramadan that you missed, you're paying it back for this Ramadan. One or two days before Ramadan, you're allowed to as well. All of those are allowed. But other than that, is not allowed. The third benefit that we take from the hadith is, the scholars, they researched. What was the reason? What is the hikmah? What is the wisdom in why we are not allowed to fast one or two days before Ramadan? What's the reason? Scholars, they researched. They looked into it. Okay? By the way, as a side benefit, the reasons why things are prohibited in the Sharia are two types. When it comes to the reason of why something is haram in the Sharia, it comes in two forms. It comes in two ways. The first one is that the Sharia will tell you why it made it haram. The reasoning is mansus. It is textually stated. 
The Sharia will say to you, you are not allowed to drink khamar because it intoxicates your mind. It told you why. You know why drinking khamar is haram. Because it what? Is because it intoxicates. This is mansus. It is textually stated. We don't need to ask anyone. The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam. Are we all together? The second type is, the reason why something was made haram is not stated. The Quran did not state it, nor did the Sunnah state it. So the scholars will go out of their way, and they will research, and they will look, and they will try to find the wisdom of why it was prohibited. This is called mustambata. The illa is either mansus or it's mustambata. The mansus means the Quran and the Sunnah explain it and tell us why, like the khamar, it being an intoxicating, was stated by the Quran and the Sunnah. The second one is mustambata. The scholars will go out of their way and they will look for the wisdom and the reason in why something was made haram. So here, why was the fasting of two days, one day before Ramadan, why was it made haram? The scholars, they researched. Because they couldn't find a hadith that states it. They researched. And they came with two main reasons. Two main reasons. And again, I said two main reasons. They're not, they're not, they're not the only reasons, by the way. But two main reasons. So the scholars, they mentioned, the scholars, they mentioned two main reasons. The first reason they said is, تَمْيِيزُ فَرَائِضِ الْعِبَادَاتِ عَنْ نَوَافِلِهَا to distinguish the obligatory from the voluntary. If you fast one or two days before Ramadan and you do it intentionally to do a voluntary before Ramadan, randomly, then you're not distinguishing the obligatory from, from the voluntary. Are we all together? Ramadan will enter and you are fasting already. There's no distinguishing thing from the obligatory and the voluntary. That one doesn't seem strong. The reason why? Because the one who's fasting Mondays and Thursdays was allowed. Not true. Sah? Was he not allowed? The one who fast Monday, Thursday was allowed. And that will cause the voluntary and the obligatory to come together, right? So that wouldn't be a good reason. The better reason is the hukm siyam, the fasting of Ramadan is connected to Ru'yatul Hilali, the sighting of the moon. And if a person fasts those days just like that, they really dismiss a ruling, which is Ru'yatul Hilal, the sighting of the moon and the rulings that are regarding it. It won't have no value then if a person could just randomly fast a day or two before it. What value does it hold? We don't need to cut. We just have to fast one or two days before it. And that's it. We'll catch up with Ramadan anyways. Are we all together, brothers? So the sighting of the moon is a hukum shar'i. It's a jurisprudent ruling. And that can't be attained unless it, what? You distinguish the two from one another. And that's the view Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani who chose in Fathul al-Bari. Ibn Hajar chose the second, second point. The fourth benefit that we take from the hadith is how the Sharia, it sets boundaries for things. Our religion is not like everybody do as you wish and as you want. There's boundaries. There are what? There are boundaries. And so Ramadan has a starting point and Shawwal has a, and Sha'ban, everything's set. The fifth benefit that we take from this hadith is the permissibility of saying Ramadan and not Shahru Ramadan. That is permissible for you to just say Ramadan. Some of the scholars are of the opinion that you can't say Ramadan. They said you have to say what? Shahru Ramadan. You have to add the word Shahar, the month of Ramadan. You can't just say Ramadan like that. This hadith is a response to them. This hadith proves otherwise. Those are the five benefits that we take from the hadith. Now.
Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. May Allah be pleased with him and his father. He said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say, Ida ra'aytumuhu, if you see it. Ida ra'aytumuhu, the pronoun. Ida ra'aytumuhu, hu, 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 hu. It goes back to al-hilal, the crescent. What does it go back to? It goes back to crescent. Fal-fad-dhamiru a'idun ila mafhum. Something that's understood from the context, which is the crescent. Just like Allah said in the Quran, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Inna anzalnahu. That hat goes back to where? Al Quran. The Quran. It's talking about the Quran. This one is talking about what? The crescent. The sighting of the, the crescent. Ida ra'aytumuhu. If you see the crescent, fasumu fast. Fast. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ And when you see it, break your fast. As in, break your fasting. فَإِنْ غُمَّ فَإِنْ غُمَّ What does it mean, فَإِنْ غُمَّ أَيْ سُتِرَ الْهِلَالُ The crescent becomes hidden from you. You can't see. There's clouds. The, the, it can't be sighted. فَقُدُرُوا لَهُ فَقُدُرُوا لَهُ What does it mean? Another narration explained to us what it means, فَقْدُرُولَهُ Another riwayah, which is the riwayah of Imam Muslim, which is, فَإِنْ غُمِّيَ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَكْمِلُوا فَأَكْمِلُوا الشَّعْبَانَ ثَلَاثِينَ أَمَا فَقْدُرُوا لَهُ ثَلَاثِينَ Do 30 days. أَمَا فَأَكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ ثَلَاثِينَ Complete it 30 days. On the 29th, which is tomorrow, we try to look for it, and we try to, we don't see it. Then don't worry. Complete the month to 30. Complete it to what? To 30. That is it. Other scholars, they said, فَقْدُرُوا لَهُ They took another opinion from it. They said, فَقْدُرُوا لَهُ Actually means, make it on the 29th. Hey, what's your argument? Where did you get that from? They said, فَقْدُرُوا means ضَيُّقُوا Tighten the month. They mean, make that month little. Because they said, we take it from the ayah, وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقُهُ Anyone whose provision was made tight on him. And they said, by tightening the month, it means by making it on the 29th. That's the second opinion. But that opinion is very weak because the hadith says, فَقْدُرُوا لَهُ ثَلَاثِينَ The hadith in Muslim, word for word says, make it 30. Are we all together, brothers? So we already have a narration that states that it should be 30. What are the benefits that we take from the hadith? Um, what we take from the benefit that we take from the hadith is, it's obligatory to fast Ramadan when the crescent is sighted. And the, fa- the breaking of Ramadan, meaning Ramadan is over, there's no more Ramadan. Shawwal has now entered. It's based on the sighting of the moon as well. Okay? The sighting here, some of the scholars, they said it should be on the naked eye. The naked eye. And other scholars, they said, if a, micro, if a telescope is used, uh, then that's also sighting. That's also sighting. Some scholars, they said that. The second benefit that we take from this hadith is, there is no consideration given to calculation. Calculation is not given no consideration for Ramadan. So what you see on the walls, the calendar, this is when Ramadan finishes, all based on calculation? No. Ramadan is not based on a calendar stuck on the masjid wall. The entering of Ramadan is not based on that. It's based upon what? The sighting. And the ending of Ramadan is based on the sighting. And this is a consensus amongst the ulama. There's no difference of opinion. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he transmitted a consensus in this issue and so did Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and Fath al-Bari. And the reason is because calculation cannot be done by everybody. Okay, it can't be done by everybody. It's done by experts. Like in the sighting of the moon and the crescent, it's something that everyone can sight. And the Sharia wants to make something accessible for who? For everybody. This is one of the pillars of Islam. Number three. The, second, the third benefit that we take from the hadith is if the crescent is 
we can't see the crescent. It becomes shadowed, hidden from us. Then we complete it on 30. We complete it what? On 30. And that's the correct opinion because we have a nasu sarihun la yaqbalu ta'wil. We have a direct hadith that doesn't accept any interpretation. The fourth benefit that we take from it is what about if the, the moon is sighted in a different country? And if it's seen in a different country? Another country says we saw the moon. You would have to fast because the hadith says if it's seen if it's sighted Fasumu, fast. Are we all together? As long as that country shares the time zone with us. For example, if it's sighted in Australia, then Australia doesn't have the same time zone as us. In other words, when we're in day, they're in night, and when we're in night, they're in day. Huh? Their sighting has nothing to do with us. Are we all together? So we look at the time zone. Anyone who's in that time zone, their sighting is a sighting for us, even if it's a different country. What about if somebody sees it by himself and no one else saw it with him? He saw it by himself and no one else saw it and he is sure that he saw it. Then he has to fast based on his hadith. Are we all together? He has to fast by himself. Because he sighted the moon. Because the Prophet said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ If you see it, then fast. Other than Ramadan, the fasting is done with the people. Other than Ramadan, the fasting is what? It's done with the people. I will speak about that in another session, inshaAllah ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith, he said Tasaharu. Tasaharu is have suhoor. Tasaharu. This command is not lil wujub, it's not obligation. Tasaharu is not obligation. Even that though the qa'id and the principle is what? The unrestricted command, what does it benefit us? Obligation. If the Prophet commands you to do something, the unrestricted command of the Prophet, it shows obligation. You have to do it. And here is a command. It's a command. Tasaharu. Have suhoor. So how can I then say it is not obligatory? Because we have another evidence that shows it's not obligatory, which is what? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he did continual fasting and so did his companions do with him. So will we sal, we're going to see it soon inshaAllah ta'ala. Continual fasting, which is that the person fast two or more days without breaking their fast. The messenger did it. And Abdullah ibn Zubair, he fasted 15 days continuously. He did not break his fast. 15 days, no iftar, nothing. Radiallahu ta'ala. That shows us that the suhoor is not obligatory. Because those companions didn't have suhoor. Nor did the Prophet have suhoor. Alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu was salam. Tasaharu, have suhoor. Highly recommended for you. And then this amr is called amru irshad. La ijab. The message is guiding us to that which is best for us. Tasaharu, have suhoor. Fa inna fi suhoor baraka. Because in the suhoor there is what? There is barakah. And the barakah that is in suhoor is barakah diniya and dunyawiya. There's a religious benefit, um, a, a religious barakah, and there's a worldly barakah in there. There is a what? 
there is a a religious baraka and how is there a religious baraka you're following the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's instruction so there's a baraka in that and also there's a worldly baraka in it which is the person when they have suhoor they will become enthusiastic and the person will be strong for that day's fasting for that day's fasting so there's two benefits in it baraka diniya and baraka dunyawiya the benefits that we take from the hadith of anas ibn malik in tasaharu fa inna fi suhuri baraka the benefits that we take from the hadith number one the one who is fasting is commanded to fast Sorry, what did I say? The one who is fasting is commanded to eat suhoor. The one who is fasting is commanded to eat suhoor because there is in it khayr, religious khayr, and religious barakah, and religious barakah. And what we said is that the command in this verse, sorry, the command in this hadith is not obligation, it's recommendation. And there's no difference of opinion that it's not that it's not obligatory. There's no scholar that's gonna to say to you, suhoor is wajib. It's an ijma' consensus of the scholars that the suhoor is highly recommended. This is the opinion of all of the scholars. Ibn al Mundi rahimahullah, he transmitted a ijma' consensus. Like there's no difference of opinion. The second benefit that we take from the hadith is the fasting is an opposition of the non-Muslims. We are not imitating the non-Muslims. Because the non-Muslims, they also fast. But the difference between their fasting and our fasting is suhoor. Based on the hadith Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet said, Faslu ma baynana wa bayna. The difference between فَصْلُ مَا بَيْنَ صِيَامِنَا وَصِيَامُ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ The difference between our fasting and the fasting of the people of the scripture, meaning the Jews and the Christians, is أَكْلَ sahri is eating suhoor. Eating suhoor is what makes our fasting different to what? To the fasting of the, the disbelievers. The third benefit that we take from the hadith is suhoor can be a person can eat in suhoor wherever he or she likes. Because the Prophet said, Tasaharu, have suhoor. And he didn't mention what you have to have. So you can have whatever you like. You can eat whatever you like. There's nothing restricted or mentioned that you have to have. Okay? It's whatever you like. Whatever. Walidalika, it's highly recommended brothers to t eat something even if you don't want to eat something you're full you don't want to have anything just so you can get the baraka drink milk and go back to sleep if you want to just just have something put something in your mouth it doesn't have to be a lot just so you can come with the advice of the prophet the fourth benefit that we get from the hadith is how our religion is complete our religion is complete. It talks about everything. It discusses everything. It answers everything for us. Our religion is concerned with what we're going to eat before iftar. Everything. There is nothing that we need. Any prosperity, success, good that we're looking for, Islam has it for us. This religion has everything for us. The fifth benefit that we take from the hadith is how the Messenger Sallallahu method of teaching was so profound. He had the best way of teaching. His method of teaching is unprecedented And how is that? He didn't just tell them, have suhoor. But he gave them the reason. He gave them the reason of why they should have suhoor. And that is something that one should do. That when you tell people to do something, it's good to tell them a good reason why. Because the person, when you tell them the reason, their heart and mind will open towards it. And they would be more inclined to doing it. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, Tasaharu, then he said, 
فإن في السحور بركة. There's بركة in it. Okay, yes, I'm gonna do it. Are we all together, brothers? This is حسن التعليم. His good way of teaching, عليه الصلاة والسلام. نعم. Anas ibn Malik, he said from Zayd ibn Thabitin. A Sahabi is narrating from another Sahabi, from the Prophet. This is called Mursal al Sahabi. This is called a what? Mursal al Sahabi. And in his Nadm of Mustalah al Hadith, when he said, وَمُرْسَلٌ مِّنْهُ الصَّحَابِيٌّ سَقَطْ وَقُلْ غَرِيبُ مَا رَوَى رَوِينَ فَقَطْ He was wrong. He said, Mursal means when a Sahabi is missing. No. A Sahabi narrating from another companion is also called a Mursal. It's also a, it's also a Mursal. Anyways, a companion, Anas ibn Malikin, is narrating from another companion. That's the, this shows us how the Sahabas wanted to learn knowledge. Even if they are their, their, their other friends or the other companions had a narration and knowledge, they will take it from them. They will take it from them. Zayd ibn Thabitin, he said, Tasaharna ma'a Rasulillahi. We had suhoor with the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day. Thumma qama ila salati, and then the Messenger stood up for the salah. Ma ma'ana tasaharna, ay akalna suhoor. Akalna suhoor. Sahur, we ate suhur. That's what it means to saharna. We ate suhur with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And then the Messenger stood up for what? As salah. What is it that he stood up for? The salah here is salatul fajr. The Messenger stood up for salatul fajr. Zayd is telling the story. He's telling it to Anas ibn Malik. He's saying that one day we ate suhur with the Messenger and then we stood up for the salah. How do we know it's fajr? And what, what prayer comes after suhoor? Fajr. Fajr. The context restricts the meaning. So it's not any, any prayer. It's Fajr. Qala Anas, Anas wanting to gain knowledge, he, in, he interjected. And he said to um, Zayd ibn Thabit, what was the duration? Kam kana bayna al-adhani was sahur what was the duration between the adhan and the suhoor? What was the length? This adhan, some scholars they took it, it means the iqama. And some scholars they took it, Ibn Daqiq al he took it as the second adhan. The second adhan. How many adhans did the Prophet used to have? For salatu, uh, for, for Ramadan, and how many, how many was it? The adhan, the first one was done by who? Bilal. And the second one was done by Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum. Are we all together, brothers? Brothers, are you paying attention? The messenger used to have two adhans done. One adhan was to wake the people up, and the other adhan was for the salah, right? Who used to do the first adhan? Bilal. And the second adhan was done by who? Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, was he blind? Yeah? Can the Mu'adhin be a blind person? Huh? The scholars, they took from there that the Mufti who's given a fatwa doesn't have to be a person who sees. He can be a Mufti even if he's blind. <coughs> based on the, based on the Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum. We're not going to go into that, that's a side point, okay? I don't want to go off track. So Ibn Daqiq al eid he took from the hadith, from the apparent, the word adhan is used here, and it means the second adhan. So between Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum's adhan until Fajr, that's Ibn Daqiq's view. Ibn Daqiq al eid and many have taken that view with him. Another view is, no, between the iqamah and the what? Between the iqamah and the and the uh, and the fajr between the two of them. Ala kulli hal ibn Daqiq al-Eid's opinion seems best for me 
for many reasons, but not for, I'm not going to mention it now. That seems, means, seems to be zahir, because the hadith shows that from the zahir. So the Prophet so Zayd was asked a question. Who asked the question? Anas ibn Malik. He said, what was the time between the Adhan and the Fajr? He wants to know how long was the suhoor for? He wants to learn. Then he said to him, Qadru khamsina ayah. The duration was 60, 50 verses. 50, how many verses? 50 verses from the Quran. Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen, he said, Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, he said that amount is approximately um, six minutes. Six minutes, he said, taqriban. If I remember correctly. He had the question, the benefits that we take from the hadith. I'll mention the question and everything here. What are the benefits that we take from the hadith? Number one, suhoor is legislated in our religion. It's a legislated thing. It's mashroor. It's legislated. It is sanctioned in our religion. And that it's delayed until fajr. So it's up to fajr. Sahabas would eat the suhoor until fajr. Because what the generation said, we had suhoor with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we stood up for Fajr, meaning they were eating until Fajr came in. Are we all together, brothers? Why? Because that is what meets the criteria of what the Sharia is trying to send, is that before you start your fasting, you are strong and you have a full stomach. So the person can eat. The person can eat. Number two, that time between suhoor of the Prophet ﷺ and Salatul Fajr was what? I mean, how long was the suhoor of the Prophet ﷺ? It was a recitation of 50 verses. The third benefit that we take from the hadith is the generosity and the humility of the Messenger ﷺ, how humble he was. Our Messenger, that he used to eat with his companions. Sahih, the Messenger used to eat with his companions. We ate suhoor with the messenger. So he would sit down, he would eat with them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He never saw himself to be high and no one's going to eat with me, I'm by myself. No. The fourth benefit that we take from the hadith is thumma qama, and then he stood up for fajr. Meaning as soon as the salah came in, the messenger stood up straight away. Straight away. Are we all together? He stood up straight away. When the time came in, he left the suhoor and he went to pray. Was what we take from it. The fifth benefit that we take from it is how the sahabas were hungry to gain knowledge and to learn every mas'ala, every issue, what is the ruling regarding it. Anas ibn Malik is a companion. He wants to know. He wants to learn the ruling of Allah Azza in a matter. The sixth benefit that we take from this is so whilst a person is eating the suhoor, he is in a state of ibadah. While you're eating the suhoor, what are you in? While you're eating your suhoor, that's a form of ibadah. You're worshipping Allah wa ta'ala in that state where you're eating. Why? First of all, the Prophet commanded you and whatever he commanded you is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And whatever is pleasing to Allah is a, it's a ibadah. Number two. Number? Number two. The Sahabi al Jalil, Zayd ibn Thabit, he chose, because suhoor is a ibadah, when he was asked about the duration, he didn't say how the Arabs were known to say, like Nahri al Jazur, the slaughtering of a cow. That's how long it took. He didn't say that. He chose another ibadah to compare it to. Which is what? 50 verses. 50 verses is a what? It's a ibadah. It's Quran. So because reading 50 verses is a ibadah, and the suhoor is a ibadah, that's why he felt it was good to mention a ibadah for another ibadah. Last but not least, the benefit that we take from it is how the Sahabas 
were not heedless of their time. And they were aware of when things started and it finished. Time meant a lot to them. That's how they were able to transmit that information to us. We would be like, yeah, I don't know how long I was there for. I don't know how long it took. Because time doesn't mean much to us. But for them, subhanAllah, everything was organized. They knew their time. They knew their, the value of time. Naam. Here we're going to go into Hukmu, the ruling of fasting When you wake up in the morning And you are in a state of janaba You're in a state of janaba Janaba occurs either by someone having a wet dream Or it occurs by somebody having sexual intercourse with their spouse The messenger والسلام, would wake up And it was what? Fajr entered Salatul Fajr entered and he's in a state of Janaba and he would still fast. Aisha and Umm Salama, both of his wives, they said, Kana yudrikuhul Fajr Fajr will enter and it will reach him. Wa huwa junubun and he was in a state of Janaba. Min ahlihi from his family. The word Kana in the Arabic language, if the khabar, if the khabar of Kana is a fi'il mudari' The khabar of Kana. Kana has an ism and a khabar, right? If the khabar of Kana is a fi'l mudari' in the Arabic language, they say, tadullu ala istimrari ghaliban. It shows continuation that this happen, keeps happening and keeps happening. That's a side benefit. Ma lam yujad qarina. As long as there's no external factor that diverts it from it. But the point is, the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, fajr would come his way. Yudrikuhu al-fajr. Salatul Fajr will come. Wahua Junubun. What does it mean? Wahua Junubun. Dhu Janaba. He is upon major impurity. Major impurity. Junub in the Sharia it means Kuluma O Jabal Ghusl. Anything that necessitates having to shower yourself. You have to have a shower from it. It's called the Junub. And it comes from two things. Min inzalin o jima. Either it, a person um, has a wet dream and it it comes from them or uh, sexual intercourse sexual intercourse the hadith mentioned min ahlihi from his family why did the narration say from his family he would be in a state of janaba from his family it is trying to show you a very powerful fit issue which is that the messenger was aware he was upon janaba so when he woke up for fajr he knew he was on Janaba. It was a deliberate act. Whereas if it was something that just happened to him and it was unintentional, Fuqaha would have made a khilaf about it. Are you with me, brothers? Am I making sense here? From min ahlihi, it shows that he had intimacy with his spouse, his wives, and he would sell and sleep. But the sunnah that is transmitted from the Prophet is, if a person has sexual intercourse with their partner, if you don't want to do ghusl, then do wudu before you go to sleep. Does that make sense? So the messenger will do wudu. If you don't do wudu, the angels will not enter the house. The angels will not enter the house if you are upon janaba and you haven't done wudu. Are we all together? So you do wudu if you don't want to do ghusl. And then you can do ghusl when you wake up, inshallah ta'ala. But then when you do the ghusl, you don't need to do wudu. Are we all together, brothers? Pay attention to that. Now, the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he would do what? He would wake up, Fajr would come in, and he, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, was upon janaba. So the word min ahli, he means he was aware of it, alayhi salatu wasalam. The benefits that we take from the hadith. That the fasting of a person is correct. If he wakes up, and Fajr comes in and he's upon Janaba, even if he didn't have a shower. Some scholars they transmitted Ijma' from them is Al Wazir ibn Hubayra in his Kitab Al Ifsah, and also Al Imam Al Nawawi, 
He also transmitted ijma' in Sharh Sahih Muslim. There's a consensus, he said. The second benefit that we take from the hadith is the permissibility of delaying ghusl. That you're allowed to delay your ghusl. You don't have to have sexual intercourse with your spouse and straight away do ghusl. You don't have to. You are allowed to delay it. The third benefit that we take from this hadith is the woman who is on her menses is the same as the one who's on janaba. So if a sister wakes up and her menses finished before fajr and she knew it finished before fajr, she was aware, but she didn't shower from it, she slept. When she wakes up for fajr, she fasts. She carries on her fasting. Does that make sense? Number four, the fourth benefit that we take from this is taking knowledge from the person you know that knows it the most. If you know some, a particular person specialized in a particular science, it's best to ask that person in the science which he specialized in. Where do we, how do we take that from the hadith? Who did the sahabas go back to in this question? Who is the one that can give the verdict in this issue? No one else could other than Aisha and Umm Salama or the Prophet's wives. Because they were the only ones who knew this about him. Are we all together? So you go to this person who knows something over someone who wouldn't know. There's another wording of a narration I want to mention here where Umm Salama said something very powerful that Abdul Ghani didn't mention in, his hadith, in the narration here. He didn't mention it. He didn't mention it. Which is that Umm Salama, she said a, a different wording. She said, Kana Rasulullah junuban. The messenger, he would wake up, he would wake up in a state of janaba. Min jima'an from sexual intercourse. That we have that all. La min hilmin, not from a wet dream. We already have that. Thumma la yafturu, and then he wouldn't break his fast. Wala yaqdi, and he wouldn't bring back that day. That's an extra benefit. Are we all together? You don't have to bring back that day that you, you woke up for fajr and you were in state of janaba. Some might say, okay, I agree that you have to fast. But does that mean I have to bring back that, that day? This narration tells us, no, you don't have to bring back that day. That's a valid, correct day. Nothing wrong with it. And that's the benefits, brothers, of bringing all of the narrations in issues. Things like that become more clear to you. And you learn many more things like that. And you also learn from this issue right now as well, the more narrations that you have, brothers, the more your fiqh is more stronger. Sahih? And the scholars of hadith, have more knowledge of fiqh than anyone else. The fifth benefit that we take from the hadith is the permissibility of being direct in issues where there is a necessity for you to be direct. If it's something that the people are shy about, but there's a ruling of the sharia connected to it, that you can say it and don't be shy about it. Inna Allah la yastahi min al-haq. Allah is not shy from the truth. Umm Salama and Aisha are telling the people about their intimate relationship with the messenger alayhi salatu salam it's something that people are shy about but they are saying it for what reason maslaha maslaha they're mentioning this for maslaha the last benefit that we take from the hadith is anna fi'l al-nabi sallallahu alayhi salam hujjah the prophet's actions are a proof the messenger's actions are proof like now the prophet's actions are what they are a proof. Now. And the Abu Hurairah he said that the messenger said, Man Nasiya, whoever forgets, wahuwa sa'imun. While he is fasting. This word men is being used here. Okay, what is being used here? Men is being used here. Men is mean means siyagil umum. It's from the general terms. It, it, the word men is talking to a man and it's also talking to a, a woman. 
It's talking to what? Both. Man or woman. Man nasiya. Whoever forgets. What does the word nasiya mean? Forgets, right? It means غاب عن ذهنه. Something that you already knew, but now it went absent from your mind. It's called nisyan. Um, again, the mudaf is mahdufiya. I'm a maf'ul, sorry. The maf'ul here is, sorry, is the maf'ul. Maf'ul, what nasiya, where is its maf'ul? The object. It's mahdufiya. Nasiya sawmahu. He forgot his fasting. So when he forgot his fasting, what did he do? فَأَكَلَ he ate. أَوْ شَرِبَ he drank. Does it matter how much you ate and how much you drank? No. Because the evidence is unrestricted. It doesn't matter the quantity of what you took in. The person ate and he drank. He ate breakfast. He ate lunch. He doesn't remember. He had a little snack, appetizer. He had a what? Dessert. Until now he doesn't remember. Nothing came to his mind. Oh, Shariba, or he drank two liters of water. Are we all together? He doesn't remember. It doesn't matter. Falyutim Masoma. Complete your fasting. It's haram for you not to carry on your fasting. If you remember, you say, Inna lillahi. Ten minutes. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un. Ten minutes is left for Fajr. Uh, sorry, for Maghrib. And I was eating all day. For those ten minutes, it's obligatory for you to withhold. You can't say, Subhanallah, there's only 10 minutes left. I'm just going to finish off what I was doing. I'll bring it back another time. No. Complete your fasting. Allah is the one who Allah is the one who provided you with food. And Allah is the one who gave you huh, who quenched your thirst. Allah is the one who did it for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This فَإِنَّمَا أَطْعَمَهُ is called جُمْلَ تَعْلِيلِيَةً The reason why there is nothing upon you is because this didn't come from you. It didn't come from you. Nothing, it didn't happen from you. It happened from Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is attributed to Allah Azza wa Jalla. It's Allah who did it for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's Allah who did it. The benefits that we take from this hadith. The benefits that we take from the hadith. Number one is Anyone who drinks or eats His fasting is correct Anyone who drinks And who eats Out of forgetfulness His fasting is correct There's nothing wrong with it And there is no sin upon him Because he didn't intend it He didn't intend to eat I mean he did intend to eat But he didn't intend to go against Ramadan Okay is it only restricted to fasting? Uh, sorry, is it only restricted to eating and drinking? What about if he has intimate relationship with his wife? It's the same. It's the same ruling. Are we all together? If he has sexual intercourse with his wife, he forgot and she forgot. Both of them forgot and they have intimate relationship. There is nothing upon them. Why was the sexual intercourse here not mentioned? Because Sexual intercourse, a lot, you have a lot of time to generally remember. Whereas generally, the eating happens where you put something in your mouth, Allah, you stop like that, generally. Even eating, it doesn't happen that a person has breakfast and lunch and dessert and dinner and then he, it doesn't generally, ha generally it doesn't happen like that. There could be random people here or there, um, situations here or there, but generally, you put something in your mouth, um, you ate breakfast and then after that you remember. So? Sexual intercourse, on the other hand, it's a lot of time for the person to really come back to their senses and remember that they are fasting. That's why it wasn't mentioned. But the eating and the drinking, it's taking the place of the mufattirat, all of the things that break your fast. Anything that break your fast, if you do it out of forgetfulness, they all take the same ruling. There's no exception. There's no exception. But the reason why drinking or fasting was mentioned is majority of the times, that's what happens to people is that they forget drinking and eating. And they just go and they eat and drink. The second benefit that we take from the hadith is the eating and the drinking does not reduce that reward. 
So let's say one who never ate. All day he was fasting, he never put nothing in his mouth. Another one forgot and he ate. Are they both the same in the reward? Yes. They're both the same. Because this one who ate, nothing is attributed to him. That's not him. He forgot. And Allah said in the ayah, رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِنَّ نَسِيلًا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا In the hadith of Sahih Muslim, what did Allah say? قَدْ فَعَلْتُ Because the dua, what did we say? Oh, our Lord, don't hold us to account something that we do out of forgetfulness and a mistake that we do. Oh Allah, don't hold us account to it. In Sahih Muslim, the messenger said, when the believers made that dua, Allah said, قَدْ فَعَلْتُ I have done that for you. Meaning, I will never hold you account to something that you do out of forgetfulness and something you do out of mistake. So, this person, nothing is, nothing is being held against him. Nothing is held against him. The other benefit, that, the, the third benefit that we take from the hadith is, how Allah Taala's mercy is very vast. And how kind and generous our Lord Allah Azza wa Jalla is. Naam. This hadith is, what's the ruling regarding the one who has sexual intercourse with his wife في نهار رمضان in between Fajr and Al-Maghrib, Salatul Maghrib. What's the ruling? Someone has sexual intercourse with his wife. Deliberately. What is the ruling? This hadith mentions Abu Huraira said that بينما نحن جلوس One day we were sitting عند رسول الله with the messenger. إذ جاءه رجل a man came. فقال he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Halaktu, I am destroyed. قال the Prophet then said to him, Malak, what is it that's happened to you? قال he said, وقعت على امرأتي. I had sexual intercourse with my wife. وأنا صائم and I was fasting. In another wording he said, أصبت أهلي في رمضان. I had an intimate relationship with my wife. فقال رسول الله the Messenger said, هل تجد رقبة تعتقها? Do you have a slave in which you can free? قال لا. The man said no. فهل تستطيع are you able أن تصوم شهرين متتابعين to fast two months consecutively every day for those two months? You're not allowed to miss one day. قال لا. He said I am not able to do that. فهل تجد إطعام ستين مسكينة? Can you provide for sixty poor? Are you able to give food to sixty poor? قال لا. He said I can't do that. فَمَكَثَ النَّبِيُّ The Prophet remained for a period of time. فَبَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ As we were sitting like that. أُوْتِيَ النَّبِيُّ The Messenger was brought. A portion of dates were brought to him. عَلَيْهِ الصلاة والسلام An amount of date was brought to him. The Messenger then said, أَيْنَ السَّائِلُ Where is the one who was asking the question? قَالَ أَنَا The man said, it's me. قَالَ خُذْهَا The Prophet said, take this. فَتَصَدَّقْ بِهِ Give this as a صَدَقَةً فَقَالَ الرَّجُلُ The man then said 
Ala afqara minni ya Rasulullah. Is there anyone more poorer than I am? Is there anyone more poor than I am? Fawallahi by Allah. Ma bayna la batayha. Ahla baytin afqara min ahli baytin. There is no one more poorer than me than the city of Medina. Two mountains in between Medina. He's referring to the city. All of Medina, I'm the poorest, he said. And he swore by Allah. Fawallah, he said by Allah. Fadahika nabiyu, the messenger laughed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the man who did, had sexual intercourse with his wife. He couldn't do anything. And then the dates were brought. And he was told to give it out. And now he wants to take it. Fadahika nabiyu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fadahika rasulullah. The messenger laughed. Hatta badat anyabu. Until the Prophet's two, the two, the four front, and then after that there's two, right? The molar teeth. I just thought some might not know what molar means. You don't know what a molar teeth is, right? So first four, after that, it's called the molar teeth, right? The Prophet laughed until those could be seen. He never ever laughed too much like that, alayhi salatu ways. All of his teeth could be counted. He laughed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thumma qala, then the messenger just said, At'imhu ahla, give it to your family then. Give this to your family. What is the benefit that we take from the hadith? What is it that we take and the benefit that we take from the hadith? First of all, the man... So first benefit, the severity and the great sin in having sexual intercourse with your spouse fi nahari Ramadan, whilst you're fasting. Because look what the man said, Halak too, I am destroyed. And the messenger asked him in another wording, وَمَا أَهْلَكَكَ What is it that destroyed you? Meaning the Prophet affirmed that this is the destruction. Are we all together? Having sexual intercourse with your wife is a destruction. It's a destruction. That shows the severity and how severe it is. Second benefit that we take from the hadith is anyone who has sexual intercourse with his wife في نهار رمضان in the while he's fasting, the greatest aglavul kafarat, the greatest form of expiation is upon him. And it's in the following, I mean, it's in the sequence that I'm going to mention. It's in these three orders. The first thing that the person has to do is, you have to free the slave, the neck of a slave. Is this slave a female Muslim or a non female Muslim? Some scholars, they said the Prophet didn't mention it here. He just said to him, Itqu raqaba. And other scholars, they came back and they said, Itqu raqabatin mu'mina. It's a believing woman only. Because they took it from all the other kafarat where it's mentioned. Which Allah said in the ayah, لا يؤخذكم الله بالله في أيمانكم ولكن يؤخذكم بما عقدتم الأيمان فكفارته إطعام عشرة مساكين من أوسط ما تطعمون أهليكم أو كسوتهم أو تحريره. Okay, not the ayah then. Another ayah, what did Allah say? وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا خَطَأً فتحرير رَقَبَةٍ so they took it from that ayah. They said the expiation, all of them are the free in the neck of a slave, a female woman. The second thing, the second kafara, after, if you can't do this freeing of the slave, the second is you have to fast two months consecutively. Two months consecutively, you're not allowed to break it. When we say you can't, if you say I can't do it, it's because of illness. You have an illness that doesn't allow you. A person can't be like, for two months? No, wallahi I can't. That's too much. The idea is to punish you because you did a big crime. What did you do? It's a big crime that you committed. So fast. But he goes, I have an illness that doesn't allow me. I have an illness that doesn't allow me. Okay? Then we say, okay, you have a lead way. Go to the third. The third one is 60. You have to feed. How do you feed the 60? Some scholars, they said, every day of Ramadan, you, give, you, you provide for two people. How many people? 60, 30 days like that. Or if you want, you can bring all 60 at one time and do it if you want to. Both of them are permissible, as long as you do it. Is it upon the person to bring back the fasting? Does he have to bring back that fasting? 
We know he has to do this kafara, okay. We know that day is destroyed. But does the person have to bring back that fasting? Or is the kafara enough? Al Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he was of the opinion that the messenger didn't command the man to bring that fasting back. He didn't. Are we all together? The messenger didn't. So he doesn't have to bring back that fasting. And this is also the opinion held by Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And this is not only restricted to fasting. If a person misses Isha, for example, or Maghrib, or Asr, or Dhuhr, or Fajr, deliberately, they see the time go by, and they deliberately miss it, they're not allowed to bring that prayer back. You can't bring back that prayer. The Salah is gone. Bye. It's finished. You do not bring that prayer back. What you need to do is lacking. Is you need to come with nawafil, voluntary prayers. A lot of sunnah. A lot of nawafil. A lot of sunan. In hoping that inshallah ta'ala. You know how the 12 rawatib that you pray daily? Hoping that would, that would do it for you inshallah ta'ala. Because inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban. Mawquta. Salah has a time where it comes in and it leaves. That time is over. If you say, I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray Dhur, Maghrib and Isha another time, you've taken the value of it being in a particular time. Isha doesn't have no time then, any. Everyone can do whatever they want it. Are we all together? No, no, no. Its time is over now. Just like when things are closed, they're, not, they're closed. If a shop is closed, it's closed. You can't just say, open it, open it. And also from the hadith, the benefit that we take from it is the man said, Halak too, I am destroyed. Some of the scholars they took from this, he said this because he deliberately did it. He knew. He knew he wasn't allowed to have sexual intercourse with his wife in Fir Nahari Ramadan. He was aware of it. Are we all together? Because we already spoke about if he does it, what? Out of forgetfulness, there's nothing upon him. We already spoke about that. But this man said, Halak to I am destroyed. What does that show? Brothers, pay attention. You have to distinguish two. The person intended the action and the person intended to go against Allah's command. Those are two different things. Intending the action doesn't necessitate kafara. But intending to go against Allah's command is what? Is what necessitates kafara. Because the one who forgot, did he not intend to have intercourse with his wife? Of course he did. But he didn't intend to go against the fasting because he wasn't aware of it was Ramadan. Does that make sense? Okay. The question here is, some scholars they took from this that the only person who has to give back the kafara is the man and not the woman. Some of the fuqaha, they took that from this. And the reason is because the messenger didn't ask for the woman. The Prophet didn't say to her, where's your wife? She has to do it as well. He didn't say that to her. And scholars responded back to that. They said for two reasons. One response they said is that whatever was said to the man is going to be the same for the woman. It doesn't have to be mentioned for both of them. And that's a good response. Another reason why scholars mentioned that the Prophet didn't mention the woman is because he didn't know what her reason was. Because the man could have forced her. And if she's forced, there's no kafara upon her. She, if he forces her, he says, I will divorce you. She's like, okay, don't divorce me. And she does it. She is mukra. She's under duress. And she does it. Nothing is upon her. Nothing is upon her. Inna Allah tajawaza an ummati al khata wa nisyan wa mastukriha alayh. That the burden is lifted from the person who is forced to do something. Another th benefit that we take from the hadith is um, you are allowed to swear by Allah's name based on high speculation, even if it's not certainty. High speculation. What did the man say? For wallahi, by Allah, there's no one poorer than me in the city of Medina. How does he know everybody in Medina? Does he know everybody in Medina? Are we all together? The man doesn't know everyone in Medina. He doesn't know it. What did he base it upon? He based it upon high speculation. 
high speculation. He looked at his situation and he couldn't fathom anyone like it. Okay? And the messenger didn't say to him, stop, 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 stop. How do you know that? He didn't correct him. Are we all together, brothers? And the fact that the Prophet didn't say anything shows the permissibility. That a person can swear by Allah based on high speculation. Also, we take the benefit from this hadith that if somebody comes to you remorseful, they are remorseful of a sin that they did, they are regretting it, they're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That you don't use that as an opportunity to hurt them even more. And say, but you did it. Subhanallah, how did you do it? Like it? Brother, explain to me. It's impossible. This is evil of you to do it. You are one treacherous person. And you hurt the person even more. He came to you repenting. He came to you regretful. What do you want to do? Score points? In England, we call it brownie points. What are you trying to get from this? The person is remorseful. The messenger didn't use that against him because what he wanted from him, which is regret, is already there. Are we all together? And that's one of the conditions of repentance. Also, what we take from this hadith is how the Prophet ﷺ was very generous and kind. That it was a hadiyah. Somebody gave something to the Prophet. It was given to him. And he didn't forget the man. He said, where's the question? Come here. You give it out. Use this. That's generosity. That's kindness. We would have said... From the UK, we would have said, every man for himself. That's what we believe. In Europe, in New England, in UK, everyone's for himself. No one cares about. Islam teaches us what? That the messenger remembered the man. He said, Aynat Sa'ilu. Are we all together? Where's the question now? Also, what we benefit from the hadith is how the Sahabas would sit with the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to attain knowledge from him. And to gain understanding from him and also learn from his manners and his etiquettes and the way he carried himself. How do we take that from the hadith? We take it from the hadith is One day we were sitting with the messenger. Why were they sitting? Because something's gonna come out of his mouth. He's gonna say something. They want to see how he carried himself, how he talked, how he deal he dealt with people. They used to learn from him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We also take from this hadith is the permissibility of mentioning your sins to someone that you hope will give you a solution to your problem. It is permissible to tell your sins to someone who you hope will give you a solution to your problem. Are we all together? And that it doesn't fall under the hadith of the messenger Kullu ummati mu'afa illa al-mujahirun That all of my ummah are forgiven except those who speak about their sins openly it doesn't fall under that hadith. Because that is talking about a people who boastfully talk about their sins. Yeah, you know what I did last night? Subhanallah, this is the sin I did last night. And he's, he's talking about it out of boastfulness. Are you with me? And I want to mention here sometimes, some people, they come into Islam. What do they become? They become Muslims. And they want to talk about their past and what they did. Okay, and they want to talk about it. And sometimes it may come across uh, you're talking about your glory days Like it was the fun days in my life That I went through And sometimes it can come across Glorifying it to the Muslims And glorifying it to the people Are we all together brothers? I'll give you an example If somebody before Islam murdered someone Would you tell? Would you talk about it? Would you talk about somebody you murdered before Islam? Would you say Before I became a Muslim There was a couple of people I murdered Will you say that? No, you conceal that. So why would you talk about zina that you did before Islam or the khamr that you drank before Islam? Why would you boast about that? At the end of the day, it's a, it's a sin. It's a sin. So a person should avoid that. Like if you have a problem, you are doing something haram and you want help, you need support, somebody to guide you to the best of ways, shara'an is permissible for you to ask advice from that person. A person and put it towards them, inshallah ta'ala. Number, what benefit number are we on? Yeah? The next benefit, I mean, the last benefit that we get from this hadith is the permissibility of using al kinaya indirect. In things that it's not nice to talk about. 
that you don't say, you don't use vulgar statements, but that you use sublimatory messages. You say indirect. Like for example, the companion, what did he say? The, mess, the companion said, Asabtu ahli fi Ramadan. He used the word Asabtu. I had intimacy with my family. Waqa'atu, he said. Waqa'atu actually means in the Arabic language, I fell on my wife. It means intimacy here. It didn't mean he, fell, he tripped over her. It means intimacy. The words that he's using here are very modest words. And some people, subhanAllah, when they want to talk about sins, they are known to use vulgar statements. They want to guide people and they will say, instead of saying, instead of using general terms like brothers fear Allah, don't do haram, stay away from following your desires. These, a lot of things can fall under that. He will say the sin by name and he will describe it. That's not how our religion is. Be in, use sublimatory. Say, say it in a package it in a right way. And all of these brothers, the more you study the Prophet's statements and the hadith of the Prophet, and you see how the companions used to talk to the Prophet, you learn all of that. You learn all of that.